Hello, my name is Marta Costanino and I have been a singer throughout my life here in England and now I am an NLP master, which stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. I have specialized working with children and I created my own practice. I can help in many areas such as behavioral issues, uh, lack of self-esteem and of course with learning difficulties. So please visit my Facebook page at NLP Station for Kids. This is the final presentation that I did for my NLP Kids Practitioners course with Judy Bartobiak. Here are my findings on how to overcome reading and spelling difficulties with NLP. This subject is especially close to my heart and you will see why later on. Okay, so first we will do a short introduction on how do we learn and then what can go wrong during the learning process. Then we'll go over some of the NLP methods to overcome reading and spelling difficulties, especially in the case of dyslexia. And I will describe the findings of some uh, NLP experts. Olive Hickmock, for instance, Robert Dills and Tony Barlow. And then my own experience, which also I think it makes me an expert. We'll have conclusions and then also please have pen and paper ready because I hope to do an exercise with you. So, how do we learn? Let's look at what the NLP communication model tells us. First, an external event happens. And we receive this information via our senses. This information is processed through various filters in our mind. And then we form an internal representation, creating a state of mind. And this creates a body language. And this is how we create behavior. Great, so now we know that we learned through mechanisms 2, 3 and 4. So what is the problem? Aha, the problem is that we are taught based on our behavior. And this is where all starts going wrong, because we each have an individual way of learning and filtering the information. So. What can go wrong during the learning process? Here we have the NLP representational system. This tells us that we learn in mainly three different ways. Visual, auditory and kinesthetic. Visual learners, they prefer to see pictures, diagrams and other visuals. They need to see something in order to know it. Auditory learners prefer to get information by listening they need to hear something in order to know it. And kinesthetic learners prefer hands-on learning. They need to do it and feel something in order to know it. So, if the way the information is presented do not correspond to our preferred way to receive it, the result is stress and frustration and then the learning process is either jeopardized or even interrupted. Now, what else can go wrong during the learning process? Let's look again at the NLP communication mo model, if you remember step three, which is where the information is processed through the various filters of our minds. As we need to delete and distort and generalize some of this information, these filters directly influence the learning process, creating all sorts of beliefs and attitudes and unconscious behavior. Specifically for reading and spelling, limiting beliefs and negative attitudes can create a large amount of unconscious resistance. And then, if it's not addressed, the learning process again is jeopardized or even interrupted. Let's begin now. Let's look at the methods of some of the NLP experts on how to overcome reading and spelling difficulties. We'll start with Olive Hickmock. I had a pleasure to interview her over Skype and I asked her the ultimate NLP question. What is the difference that makes the difference? And she categorically said mental images. So we know that we produce mental images all the time. This is very important and useful. Studies have shown that uh, babies uh, can recognize their mom from six weeks old, 
finding your own door at night? <laughs> oh, let me tell you, I'm sure my neighbor must be very happy that I have that skill and I'm not trying to open his door at three o'clock in the morning, maybe when I come back late from a gig. Uh, finding your own clothes? Mm, well, maybe only if you think it's kinky to find your partner wearing your, your clothes. Otherwise, uh, a little bit strange, wouldn't you say? Uh, recognizing your toys and someone else is, again, very useful, etc., etc. But, of course, we also need mental images for reading and spelling. So, what is the problem? Mm, the problem with dyslexia is that there is a lack of skill to create mental images of words resulting, of course, in learning stress and frustration. For me, this information is the difference that makes the difference because I consider myself to be very visual and creative and I, I was confused. But now I know that simply my brain lacked the, the, the skill to create mental images specifically for words. And that's the reason I have always struggled with spelling and reading. But how do we know this? According to the research done by Sally Sherwitz, she found that dyslexic people show an abnormal pattern of brain function when spelling or reading, in other words, an unwired connections. So what happens in a non-impaired brain here at the top uh, on the right? When a normal person sees a new word, the information goes from the front of the brain the top part here uh, highlighted in yellow, which is called the Broca area, then sends uh, or sparkles signals to the middle of the brain, which is parieto temporal in blue. And then another signal is sparkle and sent to the occipito temporal uh, in orange, which is the area where the words are formed. So once you have seen a word a couple of times, you will be able to have a mental image of it. Now, what happens in the dyslexic brain? It shows an abnormal pattern of brain function when reading. So, for instance, we'll see that there is an underactivity in the parieto temporal region responsible for word analysis. And there is an underactivity in the occipito temporal region responsible for word formation. Now, there is an overactivity in the Broca area responsible for the articulation and word analysis. So what happens is that the dyslexics get stuck here, continuously processing and processing the same word and not knowing how to spell it, how to read it, and confused. So um, the words are not recognized, then stress is introduced, and the learning process again is jeopardized or even interrupted. So what is the proposed strategy of Olive Hickmott? We know, thanks to NLP modeling, that good spellers are able to produce mental images of words and dyslexic spellers can't. So basically, Olive uses our natural process to creating mental images, that is visualizing objects, in order to rewire and jumpstart those missing connections. Right, uh, so this is the part where I would like you to do a little exercise with me. So I hope you've got your pen and paper handy. Um, write down the word owl, as in the night bird, O-W-L. Okay, now imagine an owl somewhere in your head. And now hold the piece of paper up between you and your imaginary owl. Okay. Now take the paper away and see the, the word owl written on your imaginary owl. Got it? Okay, now let the owl fly away and quickly put an imaginary whiteboard behind the letters. So now you got the word owl written on your imaginary whiteboard. Yes? Okay, now spell owl. And now spell owl in reverse order. So, here it is the exercise for you to revise. 
Now, um, let's do another exercise with a word that is not a noun. I'm not going to show it to you just yet. Let's uh, do it as before. So, write down the in your paper the word almost. A-L-M-O-S for sugar, T. Now, imagine your whiteboard and put the piece of paper up between you and the imaginary whiteboard. And then take the piece of paper away and see the word almost written on the whiteboard. And now spell it. Okay, now let's uh, test this and see if it's true that you are really looking at the words by changing the colors of the letters in your mind. And now, can you spell it backwards? Um, so, start from what is the last letter, and so on and so on. Great! Well done! Uh, this is the end of this section, but it's important to mention, actually, that the other skill that Olive teaches is grounding skills. And this will help with uh, keeping the images very still, and it also reduces a great amount of stress and frustration. Okay, let's see what are the NLP spelling strategies of Robert Diltz. Again, thanks to NLP modeling done by others, plus his own research, he explains very clearly what good spellers do and what poor spellers do. So, what do a good speller do? Look up and to the left while searching for the spelling. This is called in NLP visual remembered. They feel for the written word. It, it looks right somehow. They also feel uncomfortable to see misspelling. And this sequence in NLP is called visual kinesthetic internal. And what do poor spellers do? They use a variety of strategies, except the strategy of the good spellers. The most common strategy would be phonics or phonetics. And also they vary those strategies in the middle of trying to spell a word. So not very helpful. Okay, a good speller, uh, the internal strategy is seeing a mental image of the word accompanied by the feeling of familiarity. So these overlaps uh, between the kinesthetic and the visual system. And the internal strategy of a poor speller is inconsistency and then leading to learning stress and frustration. So what is the attitude of a good speller? That success is perceived as part of the identity. And for instance, a good speller would say to himself, well, if I spell right, is something that I did. And if I spell wrong, oh, well, it was just a, just a mistake. But the attitude of a poor speller is failure perceived as part of the identity. So, for instance, the internal talk of a poor speller, it would be, if I spell wrong, it's something I just do, you know, all the time. But if I spell right, ah, <laughs> it was just luck. So, you know, to give you an example of unconscious behavior for good spellers, this is from the research of Robert Dilts, he interviewed several copy editors uh, in other words, they are professional spellers. And none of them said that they read word by word. All of them said that they just look at the page and the misspellings just jumps out at them. And, and as an example of a poor speller and conscious behavior, I tell you that, for instance, I love to buy books of my total interest, of course. And in the past, I used to have an unconscious resistance to even start reading them because of the negative experiences I had, that I wouldn't grasp content very easily, that it would take me too long. And I ended up simply not reading them. But that has changed now. And I use, I tell you, I use a very exciting technique called peripheral vision. But I will tell you all about that in another video. Okay, we'll see another important discovery by uh, Robert Diltz. And this for me is fascinating because it really explains very well why teaching via the auditory system only is so inefficient. 
Okay, so the auditory representational system works in a sequential way, is time dependent for perception. So, for example, a song, you need to hear it from the beginning to the end. You can't hear it all at once. It wouldn't make any sense. But the visual representational system is more simultaneous. You, it's just like that. You see the whole picture all at once. Okay, for example, if I ask you to think of which letter comes uh, three letters after P in the alphabet, and now think of which letter comes three letters before P in the alphabet. So if you use the auditory uh, strategy, you probably would have to go all the way back to the beginning of the alphabet and come all the way forward saying each letter, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, <laughs> remember that? In order to find the answer that M is the letter that comes three letters before P. But if you use the, uh, the visual strategy, if that's to how you were taught, for instance, or somehow you came to, to do it, you will just see the letter P and easily move three letters after and then move three letters before because you have a clear image of the alphabet in your mind. As I said, this is why teaching via the auditory system, basically, it's very inefficient compared to visual system that allows the, the mind to have a simultaneous or an instant representation of the organization of the letters on the words. So what is the proposed strategy of Robert Dilts? So he basically pays attention to the good new feelings, you know, that are associated with behavior that the person maybe already has. And he uses that to install a positive visual anchoring, which is, this is very NLP. So first, to learn a word you're having trouble with, look at the correct spelling, of course. Um, and then move your eyes up and to the left and visualize it in your mind's eye. Second, to associate the spelling with a feeling of familiarity, first think of something else that you already feel confident and familiar with. And this is in order to access a positive feeling state. Then, when you look at the word, it would become anchored to this positive feeling instead of feeling oh, effort and frustration. This, for me, is very key to learn from the positive feeling state. And thirdly, to combat the tendency to use the old sounding strategy, you know, the phonetic strategy, he suggests that you learn to spell backwards as well as forwards. And uh, this will make it almost impossible to try to sound out a difficult word. So <laughs> try it. Try to figure out how Albuquerque would sound backwards. Anyway... Um, so what happens is that something visual maintains its shape, whether you look at it left to right or right to left. This means that if someone could read the letters of the words backwards, one could be pretty, pretty certain that the person had a clear image of the word in his mind eye. All right, so this is the end of Robert Dilts. Let's see how Tony Barlow corrects dyslexia reading distortions with NLP. So what is a reading distortion? Words moving on the page, mixing, words jumping up or down, words may appear or disappear. And these come in two categories. One is a response to confusion. The reader only has a distortion when a word is not recognized or the meaning is not understood. And only that word distorts or mixes. Okay. The second one is a response to the size and type of font. And then the entire text or paragraph may move or distort in some way. So he found that with each kind of reading distortion is, uh, is triggered by a specific stimulus. So uh, the first one is triggered by the meaning of the word. This is cognition. And the second one is triggered by form, which is the lack of uh, visual skills that we were talking about. To give you an example of form difficulties, in my case, I remember not being able to tell the difference between the stems of the letters. So B and D, uh, P and Q, 
F and Y, etc. So that's why we are now going to see what is the proposed strategy of Tony Barlow. He uses the NLP swish pattern, which is a system that I really, really like. Step one, identified that a reading distortion is happening. And this is done by questioning and trying out different uh, sort of subjects, different types and sizes of fonts and different even color backgrounds. Step two, find the exact moment the reading distortion occurs. You do this by asking questions like, is it only on certain words? Uh, is it as soon as you look at the page? Or is it only when the text gets smaller or the lines are closer together? So it's, it's a very slow process, but it's important because this will tell us what the trigger is. So if you find out when the automatic response occurs, this is in other words, the trigger, if you find that, if you find the trigger, then you can change the response using the NLP swish pattern. Step three, use uh, the swish pattern. Okay, this is a very basic explanation of how it goes. This is not the full exercise. But the main thing with swish pattern is that you have to have two very clear images. So first, visualize the exact moment before distortion occurs. And then visualize in another location of your mind a perfectly still image of the word. And then quickly swish the two images. So the image of the exact moment before the distortion occurs and with the perfectly still image uh, of the word. There's other various things that you could do, but um, as I said, it's a short version. And one thing that I need to m mention and very important, if you're not familiar with switch pattern, you have to make sure that you clear the mental screen between each switch command. Otherwise, you will reinforce the problem rather than changing it. And step four, repeat as many times as needed until you achieve some results and keep testing, of course, until there is positive change. Okay, this is the end of Tony Barlow. Uh, and now I would like to share with you a little bit about me. So yes, you probably guessed that I grew up with this type of difficulty. But to be honest, I don't know whether to cry or to laugh now. Because thanks to understanding and practicing NLP, I realized that my big problem was in reality something that it could have been solved so easily if only someone knew then about these methods of teaching. But instead, I grew up living with an invisible monster, not knowing what was wrong with me. And this unfortunately spilled over into so many areas in my life. And although I think I have been a fairly successful singer, I feel that this issue has prevented me from achieving my full potential. But now, through NLP, I am learning to value my creative and artistic skills. And I began to change my own limiting beliefs and my limiting decisions. And I know that spelling well is a skill, a technique that you have to acquire by using the appropriate learning strategy. I don't want to sound too simplistic. This subject is a complex one and there is much more to it. As it was first explained by Ronald Davies in his wonderful book, The Gift of Dyslexia. But this awareness is making a big difference in my life. And this is the reason why I also want to make a difference in the lives of children who are having similar issues and teach them these strategies so that they can grow being confident and believing that they can achieve amazing, compelling futures too. And now I would like to, or I'd love to actually, uh, share with you my experiences with NLP specifically with reading and spelling strategies. So my first experience was when I was at my practitioner's NLP course and there I was a demo on stage with Catherine Lavelle, who is part of Richard Bandler's team. And that day she was teaching us the NLP spelling strategy. So she asked me to choose a word that I would normally would have no idea how to spell. And I chose the word decision. 
And what happened next was absolutely hilarious because she then wrote the, the word in a big piece of paper and showed it only to the audience. And they all started shouting, no, 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 first is S, no, 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 it's C, no, 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 it's with double S. And even the good spellers started to doubt. So anyway, here is the technique, the way she did it with us. So first choose the word you want to learn, in this case, the session. Look at the word and decide how it can be divided. It doesn't have to always to be by syllables. Then choose three different colors for each division. So I, I did blue, red and green. And now read the word and spell it forward and then spell it backward. And then close your eyes and look up and to your left and see in your mind a big picture of the word in the colors you just did and see the three different parts as well and start spelling it forwards. And I tell you, by then I was already like, wow, this is really working. And But by the time she sort of said, now spell it backwards, I was completely amazed because I could really do it. And it was, I don't know, it was just magical for me. And I swear to you, since that day, I've never forgotten how to spell this word. And I continue to use this strategy for any other word that causes me trouble. My second experience was I was also a, a demo on stage and I was very lucky. It was with uh, Dr. Richard Bandler himself and he hypnotized me in order to make me read faster. So next day, everybody in the, in the class was asking me, so, so, can you, can you read faster? Can you read faster? And I went, mm, no, no, I, I can't. Um, so basically it didn't work and I must say uh, that obviously I don't think it was because Richard's technique was not good but because I think my unconscious mind was not ready yet to let me believe that I can read faster but now I know I can and the mind is so powerful and I would like to think that thanks to NLP and things like this thousands of people are changing and that we are at the dawn of a new human race why not so we are now coming to the conclusions but for me there is really only one conclusion and that is that thanks to NLP focusing on modeling excellence that we are now able to learn so much about learning and teaching. So there's a little story here. Do you remember when you were at school and there was the spelling test and you maybe scored very highly or maybe did you perform badly? Yes, yes. So what happened in those spelling tests? Those who did well, you know, were praised and those who didn't do well were told to go home and study more and do better the next time, etc. And most likely they did. They did start, study very hard. But surprise, surprise, when the next spelling test came round, the same people who did well before did well again, of course. And guess who? The same ones that did badly, did badly again. So by now, you might have thought that somewhere, some teacher might have asked, I wonder what the good spellers are doing well and, and what the poor spellers are not doing. But no, not at all. Some children are still regarded just as bright and easy to teach and the others thick or lazy and difficult to teach. And that is not true. The truth is that no one had been taught anything and that the successful spellers just have a natural good strategy for spelling. 
So, my dears, this is the end of my presentation today. I really hope you have enjoyed it and that it has been useful. And now I would like to sing a song that has very appropriate words. And please join me and my little friend. Thank you so much. You who are on the road must have a code that you can live by and so become yourself because the past is just a goodbye so teach your children well their father's hell will slowly go by and feed them on the dreams the one they'll pick the one you know by. If you are a parent or a teacher with children facing lack of self-esteem or having behavioral issues, children under exam stress or social anxiety, or perhaps children with learning disabilities like dyslexia, ADHD or other disorders, then maybe you would like to learn more about how to have a child that feels more confident and no limiting beliefs, that has positive choices of behavior, that knows how to relax his body and his mind at will and understands that the best way to learn is feeling good, not wrong. Please visit me at NLP Station for Kids. Thank you.